Welcome to the Doggy Dojo. I'm your host, Susan Light, a Los Angeles-based dog trainer on a quest to become worthy of the title Sensei of the Doggy Dojo. Just a heads up, this is the last episode in Season 2. If you like the show and want to help it grow, you can support it by subscribing, sharing it with your friends, rating it, and reviewing on Apple Podcasts. I'm incredibly proud of Season 2, and while you're waiting for new episodes, make sure to go back and listen to any of the other 52 episodes you might have missed. For this season finale, I thought we'd talk about something really fun, Animal Actors. This was a listener request that I was super excited about because not only do I love watching animals perform on screen, my husband is a filmmaker and part of me would really love to join our two worlds and train animals for film and television. My guest today is a professional studio canine trainer and internationally acclaimed trick dog trainer. She holds many titles and awards, including the 2021 International Trick Dog Champion, 2018 National Stunt Dog Champion, and she trained the youngest champion trick dog in the world. He achieved his title at just nine weeks old. She travels the nation doing workshops, live shows, and set work like TV and movies. Her dogs, the Joy Crew, enjoy high-flying sports such as agility and disc, as well as performing challenging tricks and skills both on set and stage. Their newly released movie is Junkyard Dogs, and it premiered in August. She and the Joy Crew have been featured on multiple international outlets, as well as viral social media content from Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Please welcome Chrissy Joy. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing well. Finally kind of staying in one place for a minute, which is exciting. We're usually on the go quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it. Um, and they travel well, looks like. They- yeah, they do. You know, we have a van that's um, really made to be like the utmost comfortable space for them. But we've since um, gotten a travel trailer as well, which kind of lets us sprawl out a little bit more if we're going to be somewhere for a while. Um, yeah, so Very if cool. we're not staying in those places, we we do hotels. So yeah, we try to be keep it comfortable. I bet that's one of the first things you have to work on. Because I remember I listened to a podcast from the woman who trained the cat for um, the Marvel movie. Why am I blanking with Captain Marvel? Captain Marvel. And uh, they were, she said it was four cats that they trained. And she said the first thing they work on with cats is being willing to travel and move around. Because it's no point training a cat to do a behavior if you can't get them to the place to do it. Definitely. And something that I keep in mind is that if I'm going to take a dog on, um, we, st- I like to have a puppy because I like to start them early as far as, you know, doing that and associating it to positive things. And you're right. I mean, I, I don't think I could keep a dog happy in my home if it was constantly nauseous or nervous about travel. Yeah. So that is a really big part of everything we do. But also it's your responsibility to make it the most comfortable and least stressful for them when you're going to take them on the road. Yeah. But I, that's just part of it that I think a lot of people don't think about. It's actually getting there. It's so true. I, I switch cars often. It depends on how many dogs I have for some shoot and then, you know, making sure they're comfortable and have circulation and plenty of air and keeping them cool or warm or whatever the situation is. You know, I have a couple shoots coming up where I'm considering, okay, taking one car into New York City because my van doesn't work in New York, but then I need my van for this other shoot. So switching the car and the crate and, you know, you you do really have to consider where you're going as much as that, who you're going to be bringing with you. Yeah. So that I think is a really interesting part of the industry. So I know that there are companies that own animals that are trained for television and film and things. But a lot of people in the industry are like you, that these are your pets, right? Absolutely. Yeah. They sleep in bed with me. You know, the, we have a rescue in the mix. Um, they're my pets, you know, they're laying at my feet right now before we go and play Frisbee later. Um, they have their off days where they just rest all day. They are my pets. This is not, um, a said company. And the difference between that is the companies will typically work directly with the production. Um, let's say, let's just use an example of, you know, Marvel, for example, they'll work directly with Marvel. However, if you have 
animals that are your pet and you don't own a company like that, you typically work through agencies. Okay. And so the agent is the one to be in talk with, um, you know, the actual production company. Interesting. And so were they your pets first and you decided to start training them or did you seek out pets that you could train? That's a great question. So I actually, before dogs, which is only of seven years ago that I started doing this, um, I rode horses. I, I'm an equine studies major. So oh. horses was my focus and my life. And um, I went to college for business and training with horses. And I actually dreamt since I was a little girl, like nine. I don't know if anybody remembers Wishbone out there. I'm sure you oh, do. Oh, I loved that yeah, show. Right? So I was about nine years old when I was watching, gosh, it must have been like Lord of the Rings, all those movies with horses in it. And I was like, I want to work animals on TV. Like that would be my ultimate goal as a little kid. So I used to uh, go in my closet and like set up scenes that I would have just watched and, you know, nothing elaborate, but I would use my stuffed animals and we would like, I reenact scenes in there. And it was definitely what spurred my interest into loving animals and also the production side. Um, You know, and so I would actually watch movies and, and really look for the bloopers. And some people just think that's a fun thing. But for me, that was like a moment in time where I felt I was really seeing what it was like on TV mm. and what it was like behind the scenes. And I was like, I just want to be in that world. It looked like such a great time. Um, and so with, and so the, in the short of it is I got out of horses when 2009, we had hit a kind of a tough recession for, for America. I don't know if you recall that time, but it was a rough moment where people were really withdrawing from entertainment and recreational activities, which includes horses. And so it was hard as a college graduate to make money in that area. Mm-hmm. So I actually sidestepped and did production. So I stepped into movie making. I was an actress for a few years. Um, I did a lot of TV shows in New York City, um, Gossip Girl, Ugly Betty, you know, a couple 30 Rock, like shows you may have um, heard of. Yeah. And so that allowed me to learn a lot about production. And then I uh, decided a couple of years later, I was working for Discovery Channel and I said, you know, I want to adopt a dog. Like I miss having a dog in my life. I had a dog as a little girl no clue that I would be doing this work with my dog. I just Mm. wanted to rescue a dog. But as I rescued my dog and got into training, um, I learned that I actually really enjoyed dog training. And then there was a casting call and the rest is kind of history at that point. (laughs) Very cool. And which dog was that? That's Beasley. So yeah, there was a casting call for Chewy and we got it, but we were actually brought on as the backup because we had no commercial experience at that point. Right. Mm. So, you know, at least with a dog. So we were brought as the backup, which means that you go there, but you're really just sitting there in case the first dog doesn't work out. And then what they'll do is they'll bring you on and you can hear Whidbey's drinking in the background. Um, and what they'll do is they'll bring you on and you just sit there. You may not do a thing on set. But what happened is the first dog didn't work out. So they came to me and they said, can your dog Beasley do what we need to do on set? And I was like, absolutely, let's do this. And, you know, they were really confident and comfortable with me because I already knew how set works. Like I already knew the lingo. I already knew where you should and shouldn't stand. Um, That experience I had as an actress. So it was really a very smooth move into working my animals on set. Very cool. And I love that they have, you know, there's that saying, never work with children or animals, uh, because it can be very difficult. I think that's a really interesting insight that they have to sort of double cast it uh, yeah, to make sure that they have some coverage. Because I'm sorry, there's no way anyone could promise ethically that an animal will be able to perform the behavior in that moment in time in that specific environment. Right? It's true. And sometimes you arrive on set and you learn that what you thought the action was, that there's a whole other situation regarding the scene that you just weren't aware of or no one thought to tell you. You know, it's and it's no one's fault truly. A lot of times production may just not know how a dog works. Yeah. So they may forget to like mention that there's gonna be maybe balloons in the scene or pop or balloons popping or a celebratory, who knows what. They may not like realize that that's a big deal for a dog. Mm-hmm. And so And they just may not know. So sometimes you arrive and yes, you'll have to have an honest communication, which I always say is your most important thing you can do. And 
say, you know, hey, this is something my dog is going to have to be, um, you know, familiarized with real quick, or we have to scrap it. My dog's not going to work if that's in the scene. Um, and sometimes you have flexibility and sometimes you don't, and you have to do the best you can with the card you were dealt. But you're right. You never can ethically say this dog is going to be perfect at this action because there's always things that can pop up that could change that. Yeah. So how do you prepare for that? Like, what are, what do you guys do on a daily basis to prepare? Um, do you just take them everywhere and expose them to everything you can, or you expose them to specific things that come up a lot in productions? That's a great question. So I think my biggest thing that I always say is that your dog should be comfortable in new places around new people, period. Mm. So whether he's got solid obedience or not, that dog needs to be able to be greeted by strangers and go to new places and be able to function and focus. Um, that's a big deal for me. After that, yes, your obedience. So it's not just that your dog can heal at your side. It's your dog can do actions at a distance of a minimum of 10 feet away from you, ideally on a mark. So the dog has some sort of position they know they need to remain. Um, you can start with something off the ground, like a climb, which is like a raised pedestal. And that helps your dog kind of have a better idea of where to stay because it's off the ground. But eventually you want to work onto a mark that's like flat on the ground and you want your dog to be able to be away from you in a new environment off leash. Um, where, you know, you can have a long line on the ground, but ideally off leash. And you want to be able to do sit, stand, stay, if you have any tricks, that's great. Um, lay down, head down, and behaviors like that. Because that's really a majority of things your dog will be hired for until you get into the movie world is going to be moved just like that. Yeah, just but on cue. On cue. Like, yeah, yeah, definitely. Some people will say, oh, my dog does a great you know, itching or whatever, scratching or whatever it may be, or shaking water off their body after they get wet. I say that's awesome, but we need the natural behavior on cue. And that's where the magic comes in. Can you get your dog to have a natural behavior, but put it to a cue? And that's hard to do. Absolutely. And how long does it take to train a dog to be ready for this kind of thing? Well, it really depends on the dog. So it also, and that's not really the dog I say, it's more, it depends on how motivated your dog is. If you have a dog that's really difficult to motivate because they're always, they're always into something else, that's going to be the hardest situation to keep them focused for these type of scenes and behaviors. If you have a dog who's toy or food motivated, then you have a greater chance of getting this behavior and keeping the behavior strong. So you know, I've had, you know, Darby here was a champion trick dog at nine weeks old. He did some really crazy things. It's a beautiful YouTube video. I highly suggest you look at it. Nine all weeks? Yes. All positive reinforcement. He's opening a fridge, taking something out, closing the fridge. You know, he's going to a mark 20 feet away. All positive reinforcement. He is like a sponge. So he's a very unique extreme of how it could be so easy. And I do not recommend that you go take your nine week puppy and expect him to be a champion trick dog. No, no, no. This is with a professional dog trainer like myself, knowing what he can do in the capabilities he can do them and in a safe uh, learning manner. But to be realistic, it can take a couple weeks to a couple months, maybe even up to a year to learn a certain type of trick. You know, Beasley took a year almost to teach the limp you know, limp across the floor. Oh my gosh. Yeah. With Whidbey, it took maybe a couple months. So it, every dog is going to be different. But what I always say is like, if your dog has a good motivation, it's going to be a little easier. Yeah. So that's what I say you should look for. I have kind of a heavy question that okay. uh, we can totally cut if it is like a super downer, but it's just occurring to me. So, you know, let's say that you aspire to, you know, train your dog for this and you go and you adopt a dog hoping that you can train them for this. I haven't run into this in my own, you know, career with trick dogs, but I've certainly run into it with people adopting what they hope to be a service animal and they just are not well suited for like this the job. job. Yeah. yeah. Well, so... I mean, ethically, if you're adopting a dog with this goal in mind and the dog, it turns out, is not going to be able to fulfill this job, how, how's the best way to approach that? That's a great question. I haven't run into that yet and I'm very lucky. 
So, you know, I think we need to establish the difference here. So the difference here is that I'm not a company. So I don't, I don't take animals in a lot to try to get them on set. Um, I work my dogs personally, who are my pets and my partners, as I like to say more than my teammates, as I like to say more than my pets. And um, I will help other people get their dogs on set, right? So they go home with their dog at the end of the day. I don't take their dog to set. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I think that's a great question. And I think if I was to look from the outside in, like if I were to pick another dog to add to my team or my pack, um, you know, first of all, I am going to do, I'm going to stack my cards as best I can so that I'm picking a dog that not only fits our family, but fits the work we need to do. So I'm going to get a, um, a good assessment on that dog, personality, toy drive, food drive, right? And stability. Like how is this dog handling meeting new people? And how is this dog handling being in a new place while I assess their personality and their drive? You know, if they, there's certain little tests you can do to see if they have food drive or toy drive, or if they're spooked by something, do they recover? I don't know if you've heard of Volhard testing for puppies. Mm-hmm. The umbrella? Um, basically, yeah, the umbrella. They open an umbrella, they see how the dog reacts. And if the dog is spooked and doesn't recover, then that might be something to think about. Um, you know, as far as this is, I don't want to bring a dog in that's not going to be a good fit. I don't want him to have a life where he or she can't enjoy all the fruits of what they love to do in our unique situation, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing is I do is a very good assessment to make sure that like I'm stacking my deck as best I can, right? The other side of that is making sure the dog's good for my family. I have a young daughter, so you're not going to see me take probably a dog with has had a lot of baggage into my home as there's a risk with a young child, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm always going to go for, I would like to introduce a puppy into my pack. And generally speaking, you're going to find that not every dog is going to have the same types of strengths for set work. So Beasley is wonderful for set work, but he is more of your chill dog. Darby is going to be the stunt dog. He does all the crazy moves and he loves to do it. Some dogs are going to be great for print because they have a great sit stay and they don't know a ton of tricks. You know, I think it's just about finding out what, where your dog's strengths are. And then at that point, catering to the casting calls that come in for that dog. I don't submit all of my dogs to every casting call and my dogs technically don't have to work. You know, they don't have to, this is supposed to be something we're enjoying. Also on the flip side, which is unique to me is that I also do live shows. So if I have a dog who could be a great dog to do for disc and agility and our sports that we love to do as well as live shows, then that's a great position for he or she to be in. But I would have to say where I draw the line is aggression or fear aggression or anything like that. And the reason is because I have a young daughter, some people would want to work through that, but I have to keep my family safe first. And that's my own prerogative. And some people may say, you got to work through it. You got to do this, but that's my own. Everyone's going to be different out there. And for me, that's just what I say is where I draw the line. Um, But I would say now, if you're going to look at it at a company side of things, I can't speak for a particular company, but if a dog's not a good fit and it's just not working well and that's their bread and butter and that's what they do, um, I would say, yeah, there probably are dropouts and they probably go find a home with a family. We're going to take a quick break. You can find Chrissy and the Joy Crew on Instagram at the Joy Crew and at the Chrissy Joy on Facebook at the Joy Crew Official and the Chrissy Joy or check out the Facebook page for Bonafide Talent. I put all these links in the show notes. We'll be right back. Yeah. 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 Which I think is a little easier for the tricks thing. I guess I'm thinking more of all these people who come to me and like, I I got this dog. Can you train it to be a service dog? And the dog's just like incredibly unsuited for this job. Yeah. And there are some dogs that come through to me and they're like, I want my dog to work on set. And I'm like, that's great. But your dog also has major issues with like a man wearing a hat. Yeah. Like, okay, well, if that's a problem, you're going to run into that everywhere on set. And we cannot have a dog ever showing any type of aggression on set. Yeah. Like my dogs can't show aggression. Your dogs can't show aggression. So I'm trying to help you by telling you that this may not be a good fit for your dog and you don't want to force your dog into a situation where they're going to be stressed. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. So 
How do you decide which behaviors you're going to train? You said it took a year to teach him how to limp. I, I assume that wasn't a tr training for a specific job at that point. You're just like, this is a behavior that I think will be useful. How do you decide on those behaviors? Um, You know, it's so funny. A lot of it is just, well, so there's a basic amount of behaviors I always want my dog to have, like at least have the distance, go to a mark, do all your uh, behavior, like your, um, I'm sorry, your body positioning changes from a mark, um, and have eye line. Like if I move to the left or the right, the dog's looking at me, you know, that type of deal. But then there's unique things that are going to make you stand out different from other people that need for set. Limping is not very common, but I really liked that trick and I wanted to train it. There's mm -hmm. really nothing more to that than I just wanted to train it. And I've actually used it on set maybe two or three times at this point. Nice. Um, the fake pee is a big one. So yeah. if you can, yes, if you can get your dog to fake pee, that's great. Holding items is also another big one. Can your dog hold something? That's a big deal. So I say if the more you can teach those types of behaviors, but I have to say some of the stuff we've been on movies for are because I just love training my dogs. And the more we get to do unique things or I teach them to have what I call like your detailed behaviors the better your dog is going to be. Dogs can have explosive behaviors, running, jumping, catching a Frisbee, all that stuff. But can your dog bring an item to a particular spot on a table? And can you trust that they'll go from one mark, drop it off on the table, and then go lie on the floor, like in particular places and accuracy? That's where the magic comes in because on set, they generally have a very specific area they're expecting the dog to work in. Mm. And so if you can hone down your skills to very particular details, you're going to have more luck and success on set. Sorry for that <laughs> bump sound. That's my dogs going crazy and playing in the background. <laughs> That's very tame play sound. No worries. Yeah, very much so. They're, they're, they're playing with whimsies. <laughs> Aww. Um, and so how do you know how to train these behaviors? Like I wouldn't even know how to train a limp except for, sure. I don't know, like the, the incremental progressions, but how do you get them to even start? That's a great question. That's a good trick. So, um, Everyone asked me, where did you go? Where did you go to learn? And, all, and I'll be honest, I really just self-taught myself a lot of things. Um, I would say maybe 10% was learned from getting ideas from other people I've seen tricks from, but 90% is just, you know, man, it's trial and error. So with the limp was tricky. I, what really what I did is I just asked for a paw, but I asked for the paw and then I asked for some motion. So moving forward and I would support mm -hmm. the paw and ask for a couple steps forward. But you know, me thinking in terms of training, well, now the dog just thinks, okay, well, you're always here to hold my paw. So mm -hmm. you're always going to hold my paw and we're always going to do this move and I get a treat. So how do you progress from that? So what I decided to do was I took like a piece of yarn, very light piece of yarn. And I would create a separation from my hand and the dog. And I would use a piece of yarn like looped and I would just loop it under the paw and the same behavior, but my hand would maybe be five inches above the paw now. And I would just ask for the little limp. And as soon as I got a limp, I would release the yarn and let it drop on the floor because I never want the dog to feel trapped ever. So mm. this is all supposed to be positive. So we do a little piece and he would give a little limp and I would drop the yarn and give him a treat at the same time. And that kind of taught him like, oh, okay. So mom's hand isn't always going to be here, but if I do this behavior, we get, we still get reward. And then I just shaped that into not using the yarn at all. And I would just ask for his paw, right? Like just as if you asked him for his paw and then he would give his paw and he would kind of hop at the same time. So it was turned into the limp behavior. But of mm. course that's taking a finished trick of like 10 to 12 feet of limping and working on it just one movement at a time until the dog is really comfortable and really confident and you know you're getting this behavior solid. And it took a lot of going back and forth, but you know, Whidbey got it a lot faster. Was that because he learned faster or is that because I now have the experience of training it? So it found it easier on my next dog. And that could be the case. Mm, that's a good question. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Right. And tricks is so um, precise. You have to be really careful what you're marking 
um, right. because you're asking the dog to do something just totally random. And so they're like this, oh, you like that? Okay. I'm going to yeah. do that. And if you mark the wrong thing, they're going the wrong direction. It's true. And, and a, I'm a big fan of free shaping. So I don't mind if you people lure their dogs, but there's a limitation to that, especially if the dog just expects to see the treat first and then does the action. Now you have yourself in a corner where if you don't have treats on hand or, or they don't think you have treats on hand, you're not going to get anything out of your dog. So I like to do free shaping where the dog is offering me behaviors and the reward comes out after that. So I may have my hand closed with treats and only when the right behavior is done does the hand open to present the treat and then I can give it. That's also a great impulse control behavior. Um, I, that's what I like. I like free shaping, which means I like my dog. If you don't know what free shaping is, they start to almost offer behaviors all types of behaviors. Let's say there was a cardboard box on the ground and you wanted your dog to go in the box, right? But they start offering, you just sit there quietly and you see, they know you have rewards, but you're not exactly telling them what to do. So the dog being inquisitive will go up and bop the box or nose it with his nose or maybe, you know, scoot it across the floor, but nothing's getting him a treat. So you reset the box and you know what, this time your dog decides to put his paw on it and his paw goes inside it and you quickly mark that and you give him a treat. So now the dog goes, okay, that worked, right? So they offer more of that behavior. Well, I'll put one paw in, well, I'll put two paws in. And of course, then you just keep rewarding until you get what you want. And now your dog is thinking more than just being shown what to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. What's one of your favorite memories on set? Man. Okay. There's a lot of them. All right. So I would say, even though we've done a couple movies in between, my favorite memories are probably Beasley with Agent Toby Barks. Because How cute is that? that? Yeah. It, it was his first movie, our first movie. And I am super, super impressed by my rescue who has tricks just going on set and blowing it out of the water. We had no backup dog. So we filmed for about a month doing night shoots. Um, and we worked through a great company called LTD animals. They do a great job. And so we worked through them. She's an agent. Um, but the craziest part is that there was no backup dog. So if anything happened to Beasley, like there's no filming. So Beasley had to like nail his role and nail his actions and do some insane things. Like he had to sit in a car and pretend to drive it with his paws while the car was up on a chassis being pulled by a moving vehicle. Wow. And inside the moving vehicle was all the camera gear. So the camera's looking down at the car and it looks like the car's driving on the highway, but it's not. And so my dog is in the driver's seat. He's pretending to He's pretending to drive the car. And at the same time, I am trying to get his eye line to look out the window and look certain ways. I mean, he just, he did things that I don't think you could find a typical dog to pull off. And That's he just awesome. blew it out. Being a rescue of 14 puppies that were abandoned in a garage practically in Kentucky or whatever it was with his, with his feral mom, who would have known that he would become this dog that could pull off something like this? That's awesome. Yeah. That's so fun. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to find that movie. How cute is it's that? It's really cute. Um, and then you should, they have a new one that just came out, right? Yeah. A so new the new one just came out called Junkyard Dogs with Denise Richards and Patrick Muldoon. And it's a really fun, fa very much family film. Um, hi, guys. Yes, they're both here saying hello. This is Darby. It <laughs> uh, has Darby in it and it has Beasley in it mainly. And their buddy, who is a pug named Petunia. Petunia is a really, really, really good friend of ours, owned by uh, my friend Christina. And my dogs are like best friends with Petunia. So it was really like a whole family filled event. Um, Whidbey did have a very, very small extra role. Uh, but I believe, sadly, it was left on the cutting room floor. And that Aww. happens sometimes. You know, it just happens sometimes. Um, you can be a part of it. We did Clifford the Big Red Dog with Paramount Pictures. Oh, wow. And most of the scenes with the dogs were cut, believe it or not. Aww. So 
you just never know what's going to happen. But yes, Junkyard Dogs is out now. It's a great family film. I highly suggest everyone watch it. Um, it's very safe for children. It's a great kids movie. Awesome. And so how do you find your animal jobs? You said you work through an agent, there's job, you know, postings. Can anybody apply for these? Yeah. And so um, that's a great question. So I, uh, and I have something unique, which is pretty cool. Um, I work through agencies and I'm at the point in my career where I don't have to hunt them down per se, but they do call me. I'm very grateful for that. Um, it was a time where really you just looked social media, look for animal talent agencies, like them on Facebook. Um, they're all over Facebook, all over the world. And just start following those pages and see if there is a casting call that comes out. You can also send them an email or write them and say, hey, I've got a great dog. Um, and definitely list the skills your dog may have and some good pictures and see if it's a dog that they need on their roster. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a benefit to having a classic golden retriever or lab, but you are also going to be against hundreds of other golden retrievers. Mm. So it's, if you have a unique breed, don't think like, well, my dog's just not going to be the type. Like you never know what they're looking for. So every dog, like the one eyed dog, the tripod dog, they all have a place. So I, I say, you know, just, just get out there and start doing that. Um, now for me, particularly, I do something unique. I, I run a group called the Bonafide Talent Group and we are on Facebook. Um, we are a very small group of just the strongest animal actor dogs that I know of, um, on the East coast primarily. And, um, if an agent calls me and says, Hey, I want to submit some dogs for this job. I also can assist them by recommending some good people I know. And so, you know, there may be a couple dogs that I know of that are available and would like to do it. And so I also help other people start their careers on set by connecting them to different agents. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. And then do you, like, do the dogs have resumes and headshots and all that good stuff yeah. where you can do their little social media account? So uh, you know, social media is great, but I will say if you are submitting your dog to a casting call, they are not going to accept your Instagram account. Not <laughs> going to accept. Yeah, they are legitimately like they need it right then and there. So what I mm. always recommend people do is I say a couple things here. Get four shots of your dog, the front of your dog, the left side, the right side, and the full length body image of your dog. Like make sure you're showcasing any unique markings they want to see. You know, if your dog is black and white on one side, does he have a brown patch or a scar on the other side they need to be aware of? You know, like you need to just nothing fancy, not the famous this dog picture you have, just a basic image. What kind of dog are they going to get when that dog steps on set? You know, they don't want to have a dog where they found out that it has a huge scar on its side or it has a, or it has a patch on them they didn't know about. Mm. Um, you know, they just want to see what your dog looks like, no frills attached. And then I say, go to your YouTube and create like a playlist and create short little montages, like 30 seconds at the most of your dog doing different behaviors so that you can pull and pick real quick a video link that's easy to access and not in your social media um, that you can send them, send the agent. Because you won't have time. They want the video now. Maybe you're at work and you want to just give them something right then and there. So have those pictures ready and then have those links ready. And then I always say if you have like a poodle or if you have a doodle of some sort, have a couple versions of those photos so that you can represent what your dog looks like in the summer or the winter oh. or a show cut. You know, some poodles are in different cuts throughout the year and you may not have the time to grab nice pictures. So just have them in your phone ready. Um, and That's last fun. note is if you have a puppy or if you have a dog who's getting older, it's your responsibility to up the, update those pictures. So, you know, that dog now that has the gray hairs, you're accurately representing when you send those pictures in. I'll add a fun fact. If you do have a senior if you do have a senior dog, it's really silly, but they do have animal safe makeup. I know it sounds ridiculous. It's legitimately by an animal groomer, groomer, like a dog groomer. Um, and they come in different colors and we have, we have, um, colored out some gray hairs before. 
Oh, how cute. I've seen it's the cute. groomers here in LA are big on the dye, but they're like rainbow oh. color tails oh. and things like so that. This is called, this is called Christix and it's by a dog groomer. And I think they use it for like your upper level, level, like confirmation shows possibly. Um, don't quote me on that. That but seems they, like cheating. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but it's by like, um, oh man, I, I, I'll send you guys, I'll send you the link. So these Chris sticks are really cool and you can look them up online and they come in a variety of colors and they wash out. So it's not something that you want to put on the night before because your hotel bed will be destroyed. We already did that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, don't do that. But do it the morning of and then by the end of the day, you can just wipe it off. It's it's, but it helps the color in like if you have a little patch here or there, things like that. Interesting. Would you recommend people starting by pursuing tricks titles as just a way to start working on behaviors with your animal and seeing how trainable they are? And and some of those tricks, like for instance, hold uh, Mm -hmm. is a basic trick on a tricks title. And that could start you towards that behavior that you said is really important being to hold different things. Yeah. So I, you know, to be, to be super honest, if you're coming fresh into this, the first thing I say is go join a group class and get yourself in obedience. Mm. Get yourself where you know your dog in a public environment with other dogs around and other people around can function and focus. So because you can train your dog tricks all day at home, but if your dog can't get out of the house or do it somewhere else, you're in trouble. So I always say your biggest thing would be to go join a group class, get yourself out there and start training under the instruction of a positive reinforcement trainer. And that way, you know, your dog works well, knows the basic commands and can function in a distracting environment. Then I always say you're more marketable if you have tricks under your belt. That will give you more tools to use and you'll be able to do that outside of the home because you're already getting experience in a public environment or in a group environment working with your dog. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So we can't do much if you don't have the basics and tricks are great. Your dogs can do tricks all day, but if you take your trick dog tricks out to let's say Lowe's or even a public, like a field and your dog can't do anything because they're so distracted. I don't care how much your dog knows spin or the fake pee if they don't even have the basics down. Yeah. Makes sense. Awesome. Well, is there anything else you want to make sure you get a chance to say? Because uh, we've run over time already, but just before we <laughs> close, is there anything else that you were hoping to say that I didn't ask? Um, You know, uh, yeah. The one thing I always like to say is, you know, this is not something that I have to do to pay, to pay the bills. Okay. And I don't want anyone to ever get into this that they need it, that this is going to be the end all be all. And they're going to pay their bills doing it. That's just not realistic. And also it, I, this shouldn't be something where you're putting pressure on you or the dog to get, to get work and to get it done. This should be fun. This should be a hobby. This should be a side gig. Um, it's a really hard industry to make a living out of, and you will possibly lose the spark that keeps you wanting to do this work. And so if you just keep it fun and you keep it a hobby and you don't get yourself down when you don't get the job, because you will lose nine jobs before you get the 10th. So you need to keep that in mind. You need to be okay with hearing no, with hearing you didn't get it and not take it personally as well, but keep it fun. And then you and your dog will always find it fun. And it won't be a big deal if you don't get the job and you'll be so grateful when you do get the job, but don't make this where this is the end all be all. It's going to pay my rent. This is what we're going to do full time. Um, I just don't think that's a realistic approach to working in this industry. And also it could take away why you love doing it in the beginning. Mm, I'm so glad you said that. That's that's yeah. awesome. So people yeah. don't listen to this and be like, I'm quitting my job and making my dog support me. Yeah. And you know, your dog's <laughs> going to get older. Your dog gets injured. You know, we're never guaranteed tomorrow. So like, don't, don't expect that, you know, your dog is always going to, dogs are not robots here. They're animals. So you get a dog because you want a dog in your life to the end of their life, not because you want to put them on set until they're not useful. Thank you, Chrissy, for joining me today. It was so much fun talking about animal actors with you. And my takeaway is that just like any activity to do with your dog, tricks, agility, rally, having your animals perform for film and television can be a hobby, provided you both enjoy it. 
Thank you, as always, for stopping by the dojo to learn with me this week. This is your aspiring sensei, Susan Light, signing off. You can find me at www.doggydojopodcast.com or I'm Susan Light LA on Instagram, Pinterest, and Facebook. The music was written by MacLight. You can find him at MacLightSongwriter.com. If you like the show, remember to support it by subscribing, sharing it with your friends, rating it, and reviewing it. I'm incredibly proud of Season 2, and while you're waiting for new episodes, make sure to go back and listen to any of the other 52 episodes you might have missed. I'll be back next year with a brand new season of the Doggy Dojo.